So three weeks before our very own Flourish Women's Conference, and Steve has mentioned this story, but um, today I'm going to share a little bit of my side of the story. So three weeks before the Flourish Women's Conference, God very kindly, in huge generosity towards our family, gifted us with the most beautiful, precious six-year-old little girl. Um, I know now that there's a very good reason why most women should be pregnant for nine months before they have a baby because it was an extremely exciting and also exhausting. Uh, it's been nine weeks now. So those three weeks before Flourish particularly because Flourish Women's Conference is usually one of the high points in my year. It's one of my huge highlights. It's also one of the busiest times in my year. In fact, our middle son, now he's our, I don't know how you say it. Anyway, our second son, um, he said to me at the beginning of the year, I'm so glad my birthday falls after Flourish because it means you'll be more relaxed. So that's kind of a little insight into our family, the, the three weeks before Flourish. And it's exciting and we plan so hard for it. And in those three weeks, it's kind of like all the plans come together and this place is buzzing. It's really just an amazing time to be part of everything. And those three weeks, most of them, I was at home with our new little girl, who, as I've said, was God's gift to us. But the timing left me feeling a little bit like I was on the flourish sidelines, getting glimpses every now and then of how hard our team were working and the beautiful things that were happening. And I don't know if you've had that feeling where you'd like to be two places at once, because to be honest, I've always wanted a third child and I've longed for a little girl, so God really gave me the desires of my heart. But at the same time, looking on, watching, Everybody enjoy the fruition of all our flourish plans was like watching from the sidelines. And I know some of you might be thinking, I could have come, I could have carried on, but because of the particular little girl that we are in the process of adopting, um, she finds big crowds, like all of you, very, very traumatic and exhausting, which is understandable. She's never been around other little children. She's only ever been around adults. So City Hill Kids has been an adjustment for her, and she's terrified of little boys. So if you have them, when you say hi, just please go easy. Um, so coming to the office, whenever I did come to try and be part of Flourish, generally was a bit of a struggle. So in that season of figuring our new little family out and watching Flourish happen from the sidelines, I came across this verse. And it's the verse in Psalm 46, verse 10, that says, Be still and know that I am God. Now, I'm not normally still very often. I don't like to be still. I like to be stuck in. But this word was part of my daily reading as I was reading the Bible, and I felt like God spoke to me through this verse. And the message version of this Bible says, Step out of the traffic Take a long, loving look at me, your high God, above politics, above everything. And so I really felt like it was as if God shifted the lanes of my life. And flourish was happening, and flourish needed to happen, and normal life kept going because we have two other sons, but it was suddenly like I was driving in a different lane, often at a very different speed, because we take 45 minutes easily over most meal times nowadays. And brushing teeth is a very big, very big deal for our little girl. I've never had a child who loves to brush teeth like she does. Eventually, I say, okay, let's turn it off now. That's enough. I'm sure your teeth are bright and gleaming but she loves to brush teeth. So the lane that I've been put in is a whole different lane to what I'm used to. But what I felt God say to me, as he said, step out of the traffic, step out of the usual lane you're in, take a long, loving look at me. I felt God say that in the new season he's put us in, he's going to give me glimpses of who he is, glimpses of the high God that he is, and different glimpses of Jesus, 
Sometimes in different seasons, we see Jesus in a whole new light with different lenses. And that's what I felt God say to me. I've put you in a different lane, and I'm going to show you myself to you. I'd like to read a story today from the Bible of a man who saw Jesus, who got to see Jesus, and his life was never, ever the same again. It made a huge impact on him. It's a great story, and it's a fun story, and it really appeals to little children, which is maybe why, at the moment, it means a lot to me. But Luke chapter 19, verse 1 to 10, the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. There's so much in just the first two lines of the story. Firstly, Jesus was entering Jericho, but he was passing through. He wasn't ever meant to stop in Jericho. He was passing through. And Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector and a wealthy man. A chief tax collector tells us a whole lot. He probably didn't have many friends. He probably wasn't well liked. He probably wasn't just hanging out with his buddies. And he was probably quite a man of purpose because wherever he looked and whenever he looked at people, he probably saw money rather than the person. That's just my opinion, maybe not. And he was wealthy. He didn't have many needs. Physically, he had what he needed. He was a wealthy man. Verse 3 says he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he did have one problem that it tells us. And his problem wasn't a very big problem. Thank you for those who got my stupid little joke. Sorry. He had a problem, but he could solve this problem because there were trees around. So he decides to make a plan. He was probably quite used to making a plan. And he doesn't want to bother Jesus. It's not like he wants to talk to Jesus or get in Jesus' way. He just wants to see Jesus, the story tells us. I'm sure he must have been hearing about Jesus as he went around collecting taxes. He probably heard about this man, Jesus, and eventually his curiosity gets the better of him. And so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot... He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. The story says Jesus was passing through, and yet Jesus spots Zacchaeus. I don't know if he thought he was inconspicuous up there in the tree, but Jesus spots him immediately, and he says, come down immediately. I must come to your house to stay. And then I love Zacchaeus' response. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. What a surprise he must have got, thinking he wasn't going to be spotted up in the tree, thinking he could just get a glimpse of Jesus. And Jesus not only spots him, but he calls him by name. How did he know Zacchaeus? Maybe Jesus had heard of Zacchaeus. But I have a feeling that Jesus called his name for a reason, because he wanted Zacchaeus to know that he knew exactly who he was. And so he spots Zacchaeus, and he calls him down. Verse 7, all the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus is about to transform Zacchaeus' life. He's about to go and spend time with this guy, and he will never be the same again. And yet around him, the people are complaining and grumbling. It's very possible, as we run in the lanes of our lives, to miss out on the wonder of what God is doing because we're caught up in our own sense of right and wrong, or we've become critical of others or cynical about life. We can miss out on the miracles that Jesus is doing. We can miss out on what Jesus is all about and what he's up to in our own lives and in the lives of others because we're caught up in moaning and grumbling and complaining. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. That is a miracle right there. 
That is an incredible story of a man whose life has been changed all because he saw Jesus, he responded to Jesus, and he spent time with Jesus. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. What can we learn about Jesus from this story? What glimpses do we get of who he is from this beautiful story about Zacchaeus? There are so many different things, but I'd like to focus in on three today. The first one is this. Sometimes we need to reposition ourselves so that we can see Jesus. Sometimes we need to find a new position because the position we're in is blocking our view of Jesus. It's possible to be near Jesus and yet not be able to see him. It's possible to be in a crowd where other people can see Jesus and we miss him. Zacchaeus was so close to Jesus. He was right there in the same street as Jesus, and yet he couldn't see him until he climbed that tree. Have you ever looked for something, and it was there all along? Searched and searched, and it was right there. I know there's some moms who will understand this saying, nothing is truly lost until your mother can't find it. Sometimes I get called into a certain bedroom. I'm just going to leave it at that. And I get told that something has been stolen or lost or it's nowhere. And very often it is exactly where we thought it might be, but somehow we've just missed it. And actually, to be honest, that happens to me a whole lot of the time too. Often I'm looking for my car keys and I'm searching all the places because I've been taught by my mostly German husband that if you have systems, nothing generally goes wrong. So we have systems for where the car keys go and I can be searching for those car keys and I've checked the systems and I'm assuring Steve that I know the systems and I have systems, I do, and they're in my hand. Or, I know you're laughing, but have you ever searched for your sunglasses? And they were on your head. Sometimes through illness and tragedy, through difficulties in life, we land up in a new position, or we see Jesus in a very different light because of the perspective we have from that position of illness or tragedy or a life-changing circumstance. Sometimes in hindsight, we wonder in the situation, where are you, God? I can't see you. I can't see what you're doing, and I can't see why I'm going through this, or, or this just feels chaotic. And in hindsight, we look back, and we can clearly see Jesus was right there. He was there all along. We just missed him in the moment because we were so consumed with fear and worry or all kinds of other things. It's very possible to be right in a situation with Jesus and not realize he's there with us in that very same situation. Other times, we've got ourselves into bad positions where we can no longer see Jesus. It might be grumbling or complaining with other people, and so we've lost sight of him. We need to change our position because seeing Jesus is so important. We might need to climb a tree or whatever that means for you. We may need to change how we're spending our time. We may need to change who we spend most of our time with because they're clouding our view of Jesus. Please note, I'm not saying don't spend time with people who can't see Jesus. I mean, that's what this whole story is about. Jesus spent time with the least likely person according to a whole lot of these people. But often... The people that we spend most of our time with will influence the way that we see Jesus. Zacchaeus could easily have used his hat or the crowds as a good excuse for not bothering to find Jesus, to see Jesus. He could have said it was too hard to climb the tree. There are so many things vying for our attention every single day, and they don't usually go away by wishful thinking. 
We need to position ourselves to be able to see Jesus. Don't allow your circumstances or weaknesses to get in the way of your view of Jesus. It's just too important. Secondly, out of the story, Jesus always responds when we look for him. Jesus always responds when, it, when we look for him. James 4 verse 8 says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Luke 11 verse 9 to 13 says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Just like the crowds in this story, it's so easy to think that Jesus only responds to those who have got great faith, for those who are really well behaved or good, for those who seem like they're getting it right. The, the people were surprised that Jesus responded to Zacchaeus, and he wasn't even calling Jesus. He wasn't getting in Jesus' way. He was just looking to see Jesus, and Jesus responded to him, and they were surprised. I've often been teased sitting somewhere with other people that they say, oh, you're a pastor's wife, you should know that. You know, you're a pastor's wife, I'm sure you'll know the answer to that. And I'm like, I don't know what a pastor's wife's supposed to know or behave like, but I know how very normal I am. And I know that Jesus' response to me is out of kindness and mercy, just like it is to every single one of us. He responds because that's who he is. And he hears us when we call because he loves us, every single one of us, not because we've done things right and not because of who we are and not because of who we married to, not because of whose family we were born into. Jesus is no respecter of persons. He loves every single one of us and he always answers. He always responds when we look to him. That's what the Bible promises us. That's what it says. The other day, our little girl, and as I said, I spent the last nine weeks almost completely becoming a mother for the third time. So most of my illustration stories, conversations, they're around the six-year-old little girl, and I, I don't apologize for that. That's just where we're at. But the other day, she, her hand got hurt. And I was up in my bedroom, Steve was with her and the boys, and her hand got hurt, and she started to cry, and it turned out it wasn't a very big hurt, but I think she got a fright, and so she started to cry, and I just heard Steve responding very quickly, and Steve's not a panicker, so I knew something was up, and I rushed down the stairs into the lounge, and she had both Steve and I around her trying to check, because she hasn't hurts herself very often in our home yet. So I was we were both just checking, is she okay, is she fine? Anyway, she was fine. We went to bath a bit later on and I'm busy bathing her. Do you know that she asked, I reckon maybe close to 10 times, why did daddy jump up off the couch when I hurt myself? Why did daddy come to check if I was all right? Why, why was daddy worried about me? She kept asking over and over again, and eventually I realized, and I said to Steve, it's because she's not convinced we'll do that. You know, any other child in a family, brought up in a family, might have thought, of course mom and dad will respond. They respond every time, and yet for her, it was a surprise. She was unsure that someone would come to her aid when she hurt herself. She couldn't believe that I'd come running down the stairs. And yet for us, that seemed like a very natural, normal parenting thing to do. And yet again, it's a glimpse of what we do with God because we don't expect him to come to our aid. We think we've got to figure things out by ourselves or we're surprised. You know, Jesus really came through for me. How and yet he's a loving father who's listening for our cries of help. He's listening and he knows exactly when we need him and he's never late. And he nef never, ever misses out on being next to us when we need him. We just sometimes don't expect him to because we're unsure of his commitment to us. How can we doubt our loving father? 
Luke 11 that I read earlier, which says, if you ask, you will receive, and if you knock, the door will be open to you. In verse 11, it says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He wants to help us. He wants to hear our voice calling out to him, and he always, always responds. We don't need to feel alone. The third point I'd like to take out of the story of Zacchaeus is Jesus gives us strength and grace to do supernatural things. He gives us the grace to go beyond ourselves. He gives us the grace to step into areas of, as Steve said, generosity and life that we never ever thought possible on our own. Luke 19 verse eight, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Can you imagine the shock of the people that he paid back? They must have realized then in that moment that Zacchaeus had had some miraculous encounter. They must have realized that Jesus spending time with Zacchaeus had made a huge impact And it was because Zacchaeus was able to do something that was completely beyond himself. When I first heard about the little girl that was needing a family, that's now, she's now part of our family, Steve was actually in Turkey at the time, and he had had a very full day, and I phoned him at eight o'clock that night, and as all good wives do, I just decided to ask him to maybe pray about adopting a third child, and... (laughs) His response at the time, I remember he packed up laughing and he said, you do realize I'm in Turkey. And I honestly didn't expect anything more to come of the conversation because we've actually spoken about adopting a couple of times and we, we, um, we've just never felt that it was right and we've had prophetic words about adopting and we really um, know God's in this story. But anyway... I put down the phone and I thought that was the end of the conversation. And the next day I got a message from my husband at about lunchtime and he said, I want to know more about this little girl. And he had had his quiet time that morning and in his quiet time, spending time with Jesus, he'd read a Bible verse and he felt God speak to him through that Bible verse. And from that moment onwards, he felt like He couldn't get that little girl off his mind and God had spoken to him and we needed to do whatever we could to adopt her. And I'm so grateful and I've been grateful for many years over our married life because I know that when God speaks to my husband, he responds. And I know that if he hears from God, he follows through on it. And so when he came back from Turkey, he didn't actually tell me until he came back. I think he didn't want me to get too excited. Because actually, from when Ethan was born, Steve told me he was very content and happy with just two children. And I know that for many of you, Steve's a pastor, but actually after school, he studied to be an accountant. So we've worked out the maths. We've figured out we're, you know, one hand one hand, two parents, two children, it all works very smoothly. And as Steve said, both our boys, our youngest son's about to start high school, so life has been very comfortable. But he felt God speak to him. And watching Steve over the last couple of weeks has been the most beautiful thing as a wife, watching my husband learn how to be a father to a daughter. And yesterday, he said, I maybe shouldn't show you the photo, but yesterday during the Springbok rugby match, and I mean, Steve loves rugby, there was a little girl sitting on the floor painting his toenails. (laughs) Painting his toenails. It was clear. It wasn't a color, it was clear. I think she just decided to 
edge him into it slowly. But we've always teased Steve that he's got quite a big personal space. He's not the most cuddly person in our family. And this little girl has just managed to weave her way into his heart. She folds his ears in every direction. She rubs his cheek. She, she kisses his nose. I mean, we know, and the boys and I sit giggling because we know you just, you don't give dad that many cuddles. <laughs> but Jesus spoke to Steve, and it's like he's got a supernatural grace from heaven to be able to go where he's never gone before. And that's exactly what spending time with Jesus does for us. When we hear God's voice, when we read a verse and it sits in our hearts and you just know that's come straight from heaven for you, it gives you the grace to sustain you. It gives you the grace and the supernatural energy to go beyond yourself, to go beyond ourselves. Now, I know some of you might say, listen, you're two months in. There's a lot more to parenting than two months. And I do understand something of that because we've got two sons, and I know that parenting is a never-ending journey. And I know for some of you, your story is a very different one to ours. And for each of us, there'll be things that we're facing that require supernatural grace, that require supernatural words from heaven to give you the energy and the strength to face what you're facing. But that's exactly my point. The people standing around didn't realize just how much Zacchaeus needed Jesus. They didn't realize when Jesus was work, walking through Jericho that he would prioritize a man who he knew needed to spend time with him. And Jesus knew that man would, would have an impact in the community through his time spent with Jesus. God knows exactly what every single one of us needs from him. And he knows just how to reveal himself to each of us if we'll trust him, look for him, position ourselves so that we can see him and do and respond to what he tells us to do. For every single one of us, we need to make a decision daily to position ourselves to see Jesus, to ask him to show himself to us in every single situation and season in our lives. What would have happened if Zacchaeus, sitting in that tree, when Jesus walks past and says, I'm coming to your house today, what would have happened if Zacchaeus had have said, thanks, Jesus, but no, thank you. Thanks, Jesus, but you know what? I, I'm just fine. I've got a job. I've got money. Life is comfortable. Um, well, I don't know how comfortable sitting in the tree was, but, it, but life is good. No, thank you, Jesus. Thanks, but no, thank you. He would have missed out. It's possible to allow pride and arrogance to prevent us to res from responding to Jesus. It's possible that when he calls our name to think, you know what, I don't actually need help. I can do, I'm doing okay on my own. And yet every single one of us, in whatever situation we find ourselves in daily, the Bible says, give us daily our daily bread. Every day we need to look to Jesus, look for him, in every situation and ask him to show himself to us. I'd like to end with one more story. If you, are you okay with one more story about our little girl? You're all right with that. So the other day she's building a swing. If you wouldn't mind, yeah, thanks, that's the swing. She's building a swing for her flamingo. Her flamingo is a little bit out of the shot, but that pink thing at the bottom is a fluffy flamingo, and she's building a swing, but she tells me it's for her and Mango the flamingo to go into the swing. Now, I don't know about you, I'm not an engineer, but I can see that swing, and she's a tiny little touch. She only weighs 13 kgs, but even so, that swing is not going to be able to hold her up, but she was determined that swing was for her and Mango, and she was climbing in that swing. So she kept adding more and more pegs to that little string, and she kept testing it. And then she kept saying, I've got another plan, I've got another plan. And then the chair on the right with the pink blanket on kept falling over. And so every time she put weights in the swing, this chair would fall over. And then she decided, no, she's going to fix that. So she runs off. She starts pulling magazines, books. She starts putting them underneath the leg of the chairs. 
hoping that that will keep the chair upright as the swing. I, I hope I'm making sense with my explanation, but the swing just kept pulling the chair and she just kept propping the chair up and, and I was just picturing her about to sit, put her bottom in that swing. So I was gently trying to say, would you like me to help you? No, nope, I'm fine. I've got a plan. I think, I think you need to maybe test the swing with mango in it first. No, nope, no, don't worry. I'm fine. Then, I don't know if that chair's strong. Should we maybe? No, nope, the chair will work. She's putting another magazine underneath the leg. Eventually, she gave up because it was supper time and we needed to clear the lounge. But there was no waste. Her, even with her best efforts, and she was putting in a lot of effort, but there was no ways. That swing with that flimsy little baby blanket and her pegs and her string and the rickety chair were going to hold up our little 13 kg girl and her flamingo. But she was determined that she did not need help and she was going to do it on her own. And again, as I was watching her, having such a giggle with Steve, because we just, we could have helped her. We could have done it in five minutes, but she was determined to do it on her own. And I know there's some good in that, is that we need to be independent and we need to be willing to put an effort. I, I get that, but she could have asked for help. And she would have had it in an instant because we were standing there ready to help her. And again, it was such a beautiful picture of what we do with God. Because we think we've got to fix it. And we, if we just do one more thing, and if we just do that, and if I can just add another peg or another magazine, it won't topple. And yet the father knows how to design a swing that can carry the weight it needs to carry, and he wants to help us. Zacchaeus realized he needed Jesus. He moved his position so that he could see Jesus. And Jesus met him, Jesus stayed with him, and Jesus changed his life. Jesus wants to give us glimpses of himself in every aspect of our lives, and he wants us to position ourselves so that we can see him. And that is my prayer for every single one of you, every single one of us, that in every season, that God would show us glimpses of who he is, because that is what sustains us. Thank you.